Hello from everyone who's joining this uh, webinar. Um, I'm joining from Brussels, where it's predictably, predictably pretty miserable weather. Um, and welcome to this uh, this webinar, our daily bread. And this is sort of the, the beginning of something which hopefully will become much bigger. Um, this webinar is the product of a feasibility study of half a year, where Jess realized that issues of food system sustainable agriculture in the European Union and in the European context is a really important issue. But faith-based organizations don't really get much of a, um, a look in when it comes to advocacy around these, um, around these issues. So we spent a year recognizing, uh, half a year recognizing 150 organizations faith-based organizations from across the European uh, 27 member states. And we have uh, put them into a database and we have contacted all of them. And 30 we have interviewed. And the idea is that we will um, start trying to formulate a network where we will um, encourage faith-based action, advocacy on the issues of sustainability of food systems and agriculture. Um, Bella, my colleague, will talk a bit about that more. Um, but just to start I, um, with some housekeeping. Uh, so this is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, I think you probably have to leave. But, uh, <laughs> but so uh, just to bear in mind, this is recorded and it will be put on YouTube afterwards. So, and we just ask for you, we'll probably be automatically muted, but if you're not one of the speakers, please mute yourself. Um, so at the end, we will have a Q&A session. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes for that. And you are encouraged to answer questions as the speakers go on. Uh, they, will, uh, uh, they will be moderated and asked at the end of the webinar. But if you have any questions, put them in the chat. And then at the end of the webinar, um, I will um, put these questions to the to the panelists. Um, and today we have six speakers. Um, but just to kick us off, um, Philippe, uh, who's the director at uh, JES, the Jesuit European Social Centre, will just introduce you a little bit to this organisation. Hello, Colin. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I don't know if you, if everyone can listen to me. You can hear me. Okay, very well. Thank you. Just the words of thanks. So I'm Philippe Martins. I'm the director of JESC, of the Twitter European Social Center. Just a word of thanks. So that's what I agree with the team. Uh, it has been a long year, so JESC more and more is working on, on ecology, so several projects. I think maybe at the end there will be an opportunity for Bill and you to speak about it. And thanks, we have this ecology team, so a lot of work to prepare this, this webinar today and the work before. Bill, Colin, we have any also, the rest of the team. Uh, a word of thanks. I was just taking this note because this is the end of a, of a work of a year. So everybody were available to share what they are doing, some interviews as well. As, that's it, the first word of thanks. A second one. So I, I think it's six speakers. If I know it was difficult to find the, the dates, but everybody tried to accommodate and it's something to be thanked for also. And finally, were the thanks for the people who are participating. This is not a, maybe the best hour, but it reveals the interest on this topic on food, food security, uh, eco agriculture. So all these topics that are important. So it's I think it's very good to be here. So it's a word of thanks. And the floor back to you, Colin. Thank you. So thank you. So without further ado, we'll begin the webinar. Just an introduction to who are these people, where we found them, what are they all about? So in our feasibility study, we have recognized all sorts of people from a very different, all faith-based organizations, but coming from quite different angles working on food systems. So we have recognized um, five of them. 
and they will um, talk about what they're doing and um, um, uh, they'll have 10 minutes each to talk about that. To give context, we have Stefan, who's an academic from Munich, and he will kind of introduce the topic, why is that important? Um, why do we need to be interested in sustainable food systems? What, why, is it, why does it matter to people of faith? faith-based organizations. Then we will go on to four really interesting organizations. We'll start with um, Susie from Brutalik Dellen, which is the uh, an international development uh, organization based in Belgium. Um, then we will go to Comerce, which is the official representation of the church in the European Union, where Johannes will speak. From there, um, I've got to get the order right, from there, I think we will go to Ferenc, who uh, is working with the Gypsy and Roma community in Hungary. He is a Jesuit. And without further ado, Juliette from France, who works for Eglise there, which is uh, working with community, religious communities and the transition. But be before we go on to them, I'll let Bella, the senior policy, the senior, the senior ecology officer at Jess, who will give you an introduction to this project. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome also from my side. So as Colum has introduced this uh, research project we have been doing, now we'll speak a little bit about the, res uh, the results of it. So we started it last summer, and the goal was to see who is out there, because we are very interested in this topic of food. We think it's very important for multiple reasons, but you know, Jesk is small and we want to start working on a really big topic. So we really wanted to find our allies out there. So we started this research project. Uh, food policy is super important. It's like one third of the European Union's budget, the common agricultural policy. But there are also other important policies there. There was the nature restoration law. There is the soil health directive. So important and really substantial policies are being made which is obviously having a serious ecological impact because of the land use of it, but also it has a serious social impact because you know food prices are maybe one of the most important uh, economic social indicators of any society. And it's also fundamental to our social and cultural lives, what we eat, how we eat, how we access, how we purchase, how we connect to those who are growing that food. And of course, Pope Francis's important encyclical, Laudato Si, would have a very clear message here, but we are not seeing that message uh, loud enough here in Brussels. So we want to change that a little bit. And also because one of the inspirations is that with the Laudato Deum uh, document, lately Pope Francis encouraged us to participate in the COP process, but I see it more as a general call to engage in political processes. So it's it's not sitting on the sidelines. We have to get our hands dirty and we have to engage uh, the political process to, to really make the change that uh, he is calling for. And well, that's, that's basically the social teaching of the church. So we wanna facilitate this process. It's not really telling all the faith-based organizations what to do. We just wanna find a way together with all the, these organizations we are starting to work with. With all research reports, we have to speak a little bit about the methods. Very briefly, we have found roughly 150 faith-based organizations. It's mainly internet search and through our own networks. So of course, we were asking all the Jesuit offices and friends and the Laudato Si Alliance and everyone we could reach out to, to give us ideas, hints, databases, and we were trying to find the ones who are faith-based and who are interested in the specific domain of food. So there are many others who work on environmental issues, uh, be that climate change or energy or, I don't know, materials used. But these ones in our database are only the ones who work on food one way or the other. And we reached out almost to all of them and we were able to organize seven, 27 interviews uh, with them and with those we could have a deeper look into their work. Um, we only worked with explicitly faith-based organizations. So we contacted also a few who were like driven by devoted Catholic people, but actually they were 
let's say, legally speaking, ordinary NGOs, no official relations to any denomination, any denomination of Christianity. This network is specifically for the faith-based ones. And then we conducted these interviews. We were obviously talking about their activities and also about their communication networks, who is their audience, who they are talking to, what kind of partnerships they are working in, what is their inspiration, what is their vision for the future, how do they see sustainability, what kind of partners they recommend to us. And many of them were found through these interviews because people we found also gave us new hints. And then we asked all of them about this idea of the collaboration. What would it take on their side to be part of it? So who are these? This is a short summary of all these organizations. Column has made this uh, interesting map where each and every NGO is on the map. With the colorful ones, we represent multiple. For instance, in Paris, we have quite a bit, but uh, most of the ones who we have found have their address in Paris. So you can see that most of them are working internationally. And then France is the second in place, and you can see all uh, the other, mainly, maybe not the Baltic states, but most of the, most of the European Union member states, uh, we could find at least one or two representatives. Hungary is obviously overrepresented because of myself, but we still, we still keep the doors open. So if, if you can give us further hints for, to expand this work, then that would be very welcome. So what are they doing? Their main work areas, we have categorized into five categories, plus we have one and sixth one, which is advocacy. Do they have a visible advocacy uh, activity based on their website and with some based on the interviews? Each uh, NGO could possibly be in multiple categories. So that's why you see in the chart, if you add up the numbers, it's way more than 150. Uh, like 90 are working on some level of advocacy, which might be just the local municipality, and for some it's EU advocacy or UN advocacy, many work with the national governments, so it means various things. The most common activity they have is unsurprisingly working with the parishes and religious communities, but depending on where they are and where they are coming from, what kind of inspiration uh, they, they follow, they do different things. Some of them are direct land users, for instance, monasteries have land and manage it. And some others, another like more theoretical part is, like Stefan will talk about, is, is a research focused uh, organizations. Communication channels. We looked at their social media presence and how they communicate, how many people they reach out to. Facebook is the absolute winner of this contest. And it's interesting if we add up all the organizations in our website, in our database, then we see 1.6 million followers altogether for all of them. So that's quite a mass, but still, it actually falls short of the possibilities in the European Union, because according to research, in the Western European countries, roughly 20% of the people go to church regularly. So that's still a big mass of people, even if church-going people are in decline, that's still a really big portion of society. So this is also an encouraging sign for us to think about advocacy and think about how we can work together with our church constituencies, because this, in another way, is seen. It's a big mass of citizens who have a power of voting and who have a power to influence their own governments and local governments. So yes, we have a big space to fill here. So on these two charts, you can see on the left side, the main social ch media channel of each of the organization. Main means here, the, the one with the biggest number of followers among the channels, because many of them have multiple. And the right side chart shows uh, the total audience of each of the platforms. So for instance, if we add up all the Facebook followers of all the Facebook pages in the database, then we get this number. <clears throat> And this is about the top communicators. So on the right side, you see the top 20 who have the biggest followership. Obviously, we have the top three who are really, really huge. And also among them, Facebook is the strongest network. So clearly in this space, most people are reached through that network, but also some others like the obvious ones um, are present in a serious way. And the left-hand side, it's a little bit more tricky because it's a logarithmic scale. But still, that's the best way to show 
on the left side, you see a small number of organizations are having a really small followership. Again, a small number has a really huge crowd and most of them have followers between three or 4,000, some of them a little bit more, five, 6,000 is also not uncommon. So what does it mean? If you compare to other NGOs, it's, we should say not that bad. Greenpeace have 3 million. So compared to that, it's not that big. But if you look at like uh, more ordinary lobby groups, I've checked a few yesterday, uh, green NGOs, uh, other lobby groups, Copa Cojaga to just to name one, they are also in a similar range. So it's, it's not that bad. We have a serious reach uh, to probably a very different uh, community of people. And what do they think? What do these people think? This chart was created only using the data from the interviews. We asked each and every respondent, what is sustainable agriculture to you? And they give really diverse answers, which all obviously point to the same abstract idea. And a few keywords were really apparent. Some of them, actually many of them, didn't really give a, a definition, but they gave some keywords. These are the most important things for us. It's biodiversity, it's local community, it's agroecology. And yes, then we collected all of them and tried to harmonize some of them. So, for instance, I don't know, it's some were uh, talking about extension of species, then we made it also biodiversity. So we tried to uh, collect into big keywords, the main, most fundamental ideas that we have found in the interviews. And these are the most uh, common ideas. So the bigger a word is on this uh, figure, the more people mentioned it. So you can see that value chain management, community, agroecology, these are the three most important ones, but also some others are, are pretty significant for this crowd. What kind of areas they are working in? In a way, that's also not super surprising. For me, still, it was kind of the magnitude of work done in the Global South that was surprising to me, although it, it is very relevant in the context of church where the solidarity is a very important principle for us. Eco-spirituality is also important. Many of them focus on various aspects of local action. So when they speak about supply chains, that often means connection to local farmers, organizing farmers markets, but also some of them are like explicitly focusing on policies, helping rural life, organizing young rural uh, farmers, keeping this way of life, I mean, rural way of life alive, although urbanization is really seems to be unstoppable. And then some of them also work on biodiversity, which is again, a key uh, working area for them. And here again, the size of the word or size of the, the tagline is comparable to how many of them uh, had that in their responses. So, and finally, some conclusions. Uh, we will have a longer report, which we will probably publish on our website in the coming weeks, uh, where some more charts will be presented. But a few conclusions we can already make. There is a very strong comment, commitment toward transition uh, to sustainable agriculture. So uh, all in all, they agree very much. And that's very nice. They also agree with us in that sense. They um, imply all kinds of dimensions of sustainable agriculture. They do talk about changes in agriculture, where agroecology was the strongest one, but also about uh, nature restoration, ecosystems, water management, uh, for some permaculture. So changing the way we grow food is a very strong element in the ideas among these people. The second one is very much connected to an ethical perspective. We have to change our way of life. And of course, here, two things stick out. One is changing our diet, and the, the other one is changing the supply chain, the, the, basically the sources we buy our food. And finally, again, for some, this was the first one, is solidarity. And it has two main angles. One is solidarity with the Global South. And interestingly, this is the more important among the group. I mean, more are working on it, not that they are more important people than others. And 
a smaller but still significant part of this group is working with poverty in inside Europe, inside the European Union. Uh, for instance, Ferenc will talk about one of these projects in Eastern Hungary, but some others are also working with poor people or in food banks or just working on supply chains that also make food affordable. So various projects focus on the affordability and the social aspects of food. Communication channels, that's a good starting capacity, but still, if we think of advocacy and changing uh, the public perception around agriculture, which is now a really hot topic, hot, hotter and hotter every day, um, we might need to work on that a little bit, but still, it's, it's I would say it's strong already. And generally speaking, we see a rather strong interest toward thinking about advocacy together. Different people have different views on how to do it, or what to do it, what should be the most important aspect here, how, I don't know, harsh or radical we should be. But uh, there is an appetite for such a network that we envision here. So we will work on a shared agenda. We will try to find the issues that are really uniting us and we will work together earlier to, to come forward together with, with some uh, shared uh, proposal towards the European Union. So we will call this seminar, we are calling All Daily Bread, and that's our suggestion for the name of this network that we are building. And this year, this is what we will work on. We will organize similar online discussions. Some of them will be more open. Some of them will be more among the ones who commit to work together with this crowd. And we will find real answers to all these questions that I raised, which topics to use, how to do it, how to communicate, which part of the European legislation we want to target. But we will think about how to make all these lessons useful for, for actual policy implementation. And then we will have, probably by the end of the year, this year, uh, we will also organize an in-person meeting for everyone who is interested. And we will work together again, building network, building trust and relationships, but also working on our shared work and gearing up ourselves towards the big questions that are coming in 20, 25, 26 on the European agenda. And you all and everyone beyond in your network, you are all invited. So if you think that this initiative is interesting, if you think that we didn't talk to you yet, but we should, please send us an email, send an email to Colm or myself or anyone you find on the webpage of Chesk, and we are really happy to talk to you. Uh, well, I was a bit shorter than I should have been, but thanks for your attention. And if you have questions, then just put them in the chat and I'm really happy to answer them by the end of the webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bella, and I hope that gives a, a good context to um, what we're trying to achieve here, what we found out. Um, and to give it a wider context, um, we have Stefan from the Munich School of Philosophy, who will give us a give us an insight into why this is an important topic and why we should be concerned. So, Stefan. Well, thank you very much and a very warm welcome here from Munich. Let me first share my screen with you. I'm a biologist and economist, not a technician. That's why it takes some time for me to share my screen. Um, but I think you will see it in a minute. Uh, just work on the technology here. I think now you should see it. Um, please let me know if you cannot see it, but um, I'll just continue my talk. I'm very happy to uh, to see so many um, friendly faces here. Um, as I said, I'm a biologist and I've been working here at Munich School of Philosophy for five years now in the field of uh, social ecological transformation. Um, let's start with a very um, basic observation. Um, our land is becoming a scarce resource. Um, about 29% of, um, of the surface of our Earth is, is, is land. Most of it is this ocean, of course. And if you take a closer look at this land, we see that um, 
only 71% of, of land surface is habitable. 10% are glaciers, 19% barren land, which we cannot use. And of the land, of this habitable land, almost half of, of it is used by agriculture already. 37% is forests, 11% shrubs. And if I would take a different graphic now, and I would just try to see how much is untouched wilderness, how much are pristine forests, how much is, is, is real wilderness, you would be shocked that this is a very small percentage. Also, the forest is, is mainly used uh, for, for human activities. And if you take this 50% agriculture, um, 50 million square kilometers worldwide, you will see that 70% of, of, of that area is used for, for, uh, for, for livestock, for um, grazing animals or producing food to feed animals. And only 23% of the agricultural land worldwide is used for crops that are directly eaten by, by mankind. 18% of the global supply for, um, um, for, for, for calories comes from livestock and 82% of um, comes from plant-based food. This is the status quo. And with a growing population and a shrinking, um, shrinking soil, this is coming under tremendous pressure. Soil is more and more becoming a scare commodity. There's several demands, and if we try to categorize that, we will see that there's a growing need for calories for a growing population. All population is growing. It will only for the next 30 years, we're quite sure it will continue to grow. And um, also the livestock, all the animals we are, uh, we are, we are, we are having uh, is, is also increasing incredibly. If we take the total amount of, um, of, of, of organisms, of, of, of mammals here on, on, on planet Earth, just the amount of them, the, the, the volume, we will see that 80% of, of, of the volume of, of living mammals are either humans or livestock feeding humans. And only 20% is, is wildlife left. Big problem for our um, big pressure on, on, on our land. And there's a lot of soil losses in the 21st century, land sealing, we're building new infrastructure, we're building new cities. There's a lot of degeneration of desertification, which is um, increasing tremendously now with, with, with climate change, with all the catastrophes, which are costing us so much, so much of our precious soil. And in the past, we could offset that by just taking chunks of, um, of wilderness and turning it into agricultural grounds. This is an option which we do not have anymore. We need these small remaining ecosystems which are untouched. And we also need to make sure that, that the, the big part of, of, of agricultural land is, um, is much more used to protect biodiversity because this really protects uh, the, the functioning of the entire system. Good example is, 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 is the protection of, of our water resources. We need much more land to, to protect us against floodwaters, but also for the purification of, of water and also um, many other resources like um, phosphorus, nitrogen are all passing through this um, through soil and are need to be set apart because otherwise um, we, will, we will lose more soil. And the fourth dimension, we, which is causing, which, which will um, put an enormous pressure in the near future on, on our land is climate protection. We need a lot of, of, of open land for renewable energy production, either just the space for, for, for wind energy or for photovoltaic, photovoltaic or, we just, or we need it directly to produce biofuels, bioenergy directly from the crops. And land is also a big potential CO2 sink especially swampland, of course, but, but also the, the way we, we, we treat our, agri our agricultural land has a big impact, impact, whether this absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere or the whether it releases additional CO2 to the atmosphere. So all these different areas are putting a lot of pressure on soil, which is becoming a scarce, scarce commodity. It's becoming more and more expensive and also making it more and more attractive for um, um, for investors, for people who, who just want to profit from scarcity. 
what can we as faith-based organizations contribute to a successful transformation? Or what can we do in this field at all? I think, first of all, we can, of course, motivate people to change, politicians or the people directly. There's a lot of good reasons for us from our religious backgrounds why we should motivate people to care better for our common ground. We can contribute, of course. Church-based organizations are one of the biggest landowners in the world, one of the biggest owners of investments, of course, one of the biggest employers here in, in, in Europe. We have a lot we can contribute from our wealth and, um, and the things we, we, we can manage ourselves. Third, we can speak up for others, especially for, for poorer people who are the most affected from soil degeneration, who are most affected if, if, if food prices go up, but also not just speak up for them, but make us listen to the, to the voices of the poor, to the, to, the, um, to the lower voices. We can be a strong force of unity, really make clear that we are one human family. It's not a winner takes it all, but one human family that needs to stick together. And the fifth thing that I think um, religion can, can contribute is the shortest definition of religion um, is, is called, it's a break. Um, it was a German um, theologian, Johann Baptist Netz, who said the shortest definition of religion is break or pause. Religion means taking a short break, going away from daily routine, rethinking my attitude, taking a break from my egocentrism, looking at the world, looking at others, taking different perspectives, and then, then starting again. This is also the background of, the, um, of this expert group of global economics and social ethics, a group of experts that have been working with the German Bishops' Conference for several decades now, and every three or four years, they present a big study, 80 to 100 pages, to the German Bishops' Conference, and they give it to German and European politicians. The past years, we were always invited to the German Parliament to present the outcome of, of, of these studies, how to make global economics and social ethics more sustainable and, and, and more just for all people. And the starting point for, for the last studies was Pope Francis with his, um, with his famous quote, this economy kills. You see some of the people here in, in this expert group are economists and they don't look like killers. And um, we, we tried to take an um, academic approach to that and say, how, how can, should we change our economy to make sure that it's more friendly and, 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 and life-serving? We wrote a um, big, um, big study here, Exit from Growth. Another one, how social ecological transformation can succeed. And now we're in the process of, of, of preparing a new study on food security, climate protection, biodiversity, and the biodiversity elements of global land use and change. And the first thing that in all we're trying in all these studies is we were really fascinated that people from outside church always told us, please, first of all, give us a positive perspective. If church is contributing anything at all, it should be a positive perspective. Let us, let's give hope to the world. And if you as churchgoers don't have hope, then why should the rest of the world have hope? So describe a positive perspective first, based on ethical reason. Then we always try to identify the blockades and obstacles using examples of energy transition, consumer mobility transition, agriculture transition. And then from these barriers, we try to formulate some key levers or adjustment screws. How can we make a successful transformation work? And I'll just give you a very short overview. Um, it's a big study and I just wanna point some of the biggest um, um, categories which we found that, that all the transformation processes, whether it's in an organization, whether it's in church, whether it's, um, it's a single social ecological transformation, all the transformation processes, there's always four categories of barriers which we're experiencing. The first category, there's always weak institutions involved and an unfit regulatory policy. In the field of agriculture, it's mainly subsidies, which used to work in the past, but are not working anymore. It's very clear the old system is broke. We cannot um, have subsidies which are mainly 
focused on on, on 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 land use on the on the area of land you own and the more area of land you own the more subsidies you get and if we take uh, if if we apply this this old institutional system um, to uh, to the European Union of the future if if Ukraine joins the European Union the entire system will be broke because all the all the subsidies would have to go to, to Ukraine and Ukraine farmers. So we know weak institutions are always a big problem, part of the problem. But if we change this, we're always immediately in the second category, distributional conflicts and unequal power relations. There's so many people who, um, who profit a lot from these unequal power relations, from the weak institutions, and who are afraid of losing it. And for these people, it's very easy to take advantage of the third category of problem, a lack of positive political influence and in communication. Quite often, we are not able in, in, in our democracy to really make sure that all the people involved in the process see that they can profit from that, and they can trust that they can profit from a transform transformation uh, process. Most of them are mostly afraid of losing something. And it's especially if populists move, move into this problem. Populists, which, which are very often get, get their money from, 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 um, from people who, who, who own a lot and have a lot to, to, to lose. These populists always profit from our neglect of the cultural dimension. We see this very clear at the moment of the, uh, with, with the protests of farmers here in Germany. We had a um, demonstration here, here, here last week and um, one of the leading right-wing uh, politicians, who is a farmer as well, was there and he demonstrated against um, plans of the German government to, to cut down the diesel subsidies for farmers. And this, um, this populist um, politician was asked, how much money would you lose yourself as a farmer? And he said, it's 200 euros per year. 200 euros he will lose. And for most of this, of his colleagues, they, they, it was a little more they would lose, but it wasn't a real big amount. But there was so much hatred and, and so much people being afraid of, of, of losing more. And mainly the problem, we as politicians and most of society didn't acknowledge the cultural dimensions. Farmers who, who are afraid that, that they are not really um, recognized as, as, as people who, um, who are the, the basis of our food system, who work for us very hardly. This cultural dimension is, is, is often a big part of, of, of the problem. The public perception of, of how we see farmers and the self-perception of them are totally apart. And what we try to do in all our studies is make sure that, uh, explain to, to politicians and the, and the broader public, in any transformation process, you always make, need to be sure that you address all of these categories at the same time. We need to create a regulatory framework that promotes innovation and the common good. A different subsidy system. We need a fairer distribution of burdens and of new opportunities for everyone. We need the promotion of support through, through transparency and participation. Democracy in the 21st century will only survive. It is much more transparent and if participation is, is made easy, and if you acknowledge the cultural dimension of transformation. I'm sorry I cannot go into the details in this very short summary here, but what we try to, 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 to always make clear in, in, in our studies is that all these four dimensions are equally important. And you have to adjust all of these, um, address all of them at the same time if, if, if you have, want to have a successful transformation process. Last slide here. Just a short glimpse of what we are discussing right now and what we will present in the study we will, um, we will um, publish in, in, in September. Facing the multiple challenges of climate, um, of, of climate change, food security, land use, and biodiversity protection, we need a multi-gain strategy for common good-oriented land use. And in order to have that, we need to rethink some of our old concepts concepts, especially efficiency. In the old times, we only tried to be efficient in one area. Like efficiency means for a farmer, you, you're totally focused on calorie production, or you're totally focused on, on renewable energy production. Efficiency in the new world is 
always connected to a multi-game strategy. Ownership. In the past, it was single farmers we had to address. Now, if we are talking about flood water protect protection, if we want to talk about renewable energy protection on a larger scale, it will be groups of farmers who really have to cooperate. If one of them is against them, it's a big problem. So ownership is something we really have to rethink. On a global farm scale, we see that it's often a problem that small farmers are often not too efficient and wasting resources, especially, especially water. While at the same time, large scale industrial farming is often not sustainable and overusing our resources. So we have to find a kind of middle way for that. We said we, we need to discuss the idea of sustainable intensification or ecological intensification of agriculture. We need to intensify cooperations, partnerships, innovation sharings, not just on a national level, but on the international levels. And that's what we're discussing at the moment. And that's why I'm very happy to be part of, the, of, of this group and this process here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. That was really interesting and a really important context for us. So now we go on to this next stage where we uh, listen to four of the organizations who we interviewed and to see it at their contribution. So going in alphabetical order, we begin with Brutalik Dellen, um, and Susie. So Anika will just share the, uh, the presentation and we'll get started. Okay, uh, thank you, Colm. Can everybody hear me? Uh, I'm assuming you can. Um, uh, my name is Susie. I work as a, a policy officer for food systems uh, at uh, Broederlijk Delen. Um, and I um, uh, called my presentation uh, why uh, sustainable food systems need system change, because that is what we uh, are advocating for. And you can go to the next slide, please. Um, first of all, Broederlijk Delen um, is a, a faith-based organization. We have our roots in the Catholic Church. And as um, Colm already said, we are based in Belgium and more specifically in the northern part of Belgium, in the Flemish-speaking uh, part um, of it. Um, we are an old organization and, and we came into life in 1961 after a call from the Belgian Bishops Conference um, for solidarity with the Congolese people uh, in, um, who were suffering from hunger. And as uh, Congo was a, a former colony of Belgium, um, we were um, called upon to be um, solid um, to support um, uh, these people. Um, and as you can see, um, I put the very first uh, campaign um, uh, image um, on the uh, on the presentation, and I think this is a very good example of um, uh, or a very good illustration of uh, our daily bread that we already um, used um, more than sixty years ago um, to um, to ask uh, people in um, in Belgium to be um, to support um, their brothers and sisters in uh, in Africa. Uh, so as an organization, we strive for a sustainable world without inequality. And we see that sharing and redistribution of um, uh, money and goods is um, a lever uh, to do so, as is investing in the initiatives that are taken by the poorest communities in our partner countries uh, to, uh, to better their situation. As I said, we are a campaign NGO. Uh, that means that every year we have a, a Lenten campaign that is uh, fully ongoing uh, right now. And this year we are focusing again on RDC, uh, the country uh, uh, on Congo. Um, and um, we are demonstrating how people can um, protect the land that they, are, uh, that they use for agriculture by working uh, collectively. Um, next slide, please. We work um, in different countries, um, six countries in uh, Africa, uh, five in Latin America, and then uh, Israel, Palestine. Uh, and of course, we are also active in uh, Belgium. We work together with more than 80 partner organizations. And in Belgium, we can count on um, a network of about 2,000 volunteers. Um, and this network is uh, still quite strongly linked to the parishes in uh, the five uh, provinces in uh, Flanders. Uh, next slide, please. 
I show this image because um, I think that um, uh, Stefan already um, uh, referred to it. Um, we start from an, uh, from an analysis that our global economy is totally um, derailing. Um, it's using an enormous amount of natural resources, but also cheap labor uh, that it finds where it is uh, uh, the cheapest and um, natural resources and um, human beings, people are being used to produce a lot of uh, consumer junk without taking into account um, the environmental and social effects that um, this uh, global economy has on uh, the least well off in, uh, in the community. Next slide, please. So basically, um, most of you have probably heard of the, the donut uh, theory of uh, Kate Rayworth. Um, and she says that, um, um, we in when we look at our economy we have to take into account both an ecological ceiling um so that are the natural processes that are um, um, uh, um ruling our uh, planet and we have a finite amount of water we have a finite amount of land uh, we have a finite amount of biodiversity and when we lose it we lose it um irreplaceably and we are uh, progressing quite a number of these um uh, boundaries already but inside the donut there's a social foundation and when people do not have enough income they don't have education they don't have access to food to water to health etc they are also um there's there are social shortfalls so the whole idea is that we need to change the system to get our economy and also the way we produce our food because um as it was said um the way we produce and consume uh, and, and transform our food uh, contributes to a lot of um, the, um, um, the, the the transgressing of the boundaries. Uh, so we have to put our economy back into the safe and just space for humanity. Um, next slide, please. And this is what, um, when it comes to food systems, we see that there's a clear um, solution to it and we promote agroecology as a solution. And agroecology is much more than just a different way of uh, producing food. It's not only about um, um, uh, farming techniques, it's also addressing um, power system, power relationships within uh, the food system. It's about setting, uh, putting the farmers again in the center of this food system, about um, recreating linkages between the eaters and the people who produce our food, etc. So it is a drastic uh, change that we are advocating for. Next slide, please. To do this um, and to work um, on this um, uh, system change, uh, we um, uh, promote five uh, strategies for change. Um, we, um, I think that maybe there is a slide that has been missing, but that's okay. Um, I'll continue like this. Uh, one before even. I think... Uh... I just go back very quickly. No, that's okay. It's these, okay. These, so, these are in in order. Okay, yeah, it's, it's fine. Uh, so we have five strategies uh, to uh, uh, to promote this uh, system change. Um, first of all, we work in networks. Of course, you cannot do anything uh, when you're a small organization uh, like we are. So we um, uh, connect people. Uh, we work in networks at the local, national, international level. Um, and we work in a very close relationship with our partners. Um, so we co-create... Um, our strategies together with our partners in the southern countries. Um, we raise awareness and we sensitize um, uh, people, especially in Belgium, uh, for behavior change, because we, we really realize that in order to um, create opportunities for growth in our partner countries, we need to degrow. Um, and um, in Belgium, we also uh, support the um, uh, initiatives of the volunteers um, that they are taking. Um, and of course, um, very important is that we do advocacy work at the Belgian level uh, towards the EU, but also in um, very close collaboration um, with our partners who also do their own advocacy uh, towards their own governments in their um, countries. Next slide. Of course, there's challenges. Um, um, uh, one of them is that uh, we notice that there is a shrinking space for civil society organizations and human rights defenders in many countries that we work in. Uh, so their work becomes more and more difficult um, to do. 
Um, in our own country, um, we, we notice that um, uh, it becomes more and more challenging to uh, compensate fundraising. Uh, we, we used to get our donations from the church. Now we have to, they, they shrink every year because um, we are in a more and more secular environment. The people who go to church, they become older and older. And so the, um, um, uh, our uh, volunteer base is becoming smaller and smaller. And to compensate the, um, uh, the loss of donations by fundraising is uh, very uh, challenging. And also with our volunteers, they are aging um, and there are youngsters that um, are taking their place, but they're much less loyal to the organization, to the uh, to to uh, to our organization. They shop around and uh, whenever you offer something that they are interested in, they will support you, but they are um, gone uh, very quickly as well. And then on the political level, um, it's a, it's a, a 2024 will be a challenging year because there's elections in Belgium, there's elections in the EU, there's actually elections in half of the world. Um, so this will certainly have um, implications for our political work. And um, we also wonder what, um, at the uh, European level then, what the future of the Green Deal will be. And I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. It's quite inspiring what you do. And you're absolutely right. There's, it seems that every election in the world is happening this year. So um, next we um, we go to um, Commerset and Johannes representing the, uh, the the church in here. Thank you very much, Colm. Um, yeah, as mentioned, I work for Commerset. Good afternoon. Um, I'm the policy advisor on ecology, energy, and agriculture. And I will divide my short presentation in three parts. First, I will present in a few words our mission as Commerset in general then our mission in the field of sustainability and agriculture. And then finally, I will speak about some of our main challenges in this mission. And you will see that some of the topics or many of them actually have already been touched upon by Stefan and Susie. So at first, uh, what is Commissé? And um, Commissé is an institution of the church and it is composed of all the bishops conferences in the European Union. It represents the interests of them at the European institutions and each bishops conference in the EU has a bishop who is responsible for European affairs and they together they represent Commissé. They come here together twice a year in plenaries to discuss together their priorities with us, the Secretariat, but then also with officials from the EU institutions. And then based on these priorities and mandates, we the policy advisors then have to promote and sometimes even develop positions for the church for concrete political uh, developments, policies at the EU level. Obviously this work has to be based upon Catholic social teaching and all this gets approved first. And actually on some issues, uh, we are in very close contact with the Holy See, especially the Dickestery for human integral development. But the basis for our work is article 17 of the treaty on the functioning of the European Union, which obliges the European institutions to maintain, maintain a dialogue with religions. Now this dialogue takes different shapes and I will just name a few here so you will get an idea of how this dialogue looks like or can look like. So on the side of the European Commission and the European Parliament, there are several times a year so-called official high-level meetings between representatives from the institutions and religions. So for instance, last week, the president of Commissé, Bishop Kruchata, and Bishop Hohenbohm, the Commissé Bishop from the Netherlands, they participated in a meeting at the Commission with uh, Vice President Margarita Spinas. So this is the official part. Uh, we also engage in official meetings with representatives of the respective country presiding the European Council, which is currently Belgium. Uh, but also part of our work is to have regular contacts with MEPs in the parliament, officials working at the commission and other institutions. And here we engage in discussions about concrete legislative initiatives. And we try to make ensure to ensure that the perspective of the church is heard and taken into account. Well, as you can imagine, sometimes with more, sometimes with less success. But what is important here to remember is that our work consists mainly of political advocacy on behalf of the church. So we're not biologists like Stefan. Um, all right, let's move to our mission in the field of agriculture, which 
course, is very connected to our advocacy and ecological um, issues, also on energy. And our main mission here is to promote an integral understanding of ecology at the European institutions. The basis, unsurprisingly, for his work is uh, Laudato Si. So an integral understanding, in short, means everything is connected. You've probably heard this a thousand times. Um, but many people here have not, and so it's important to repeat this message over and over and to say that our relationship with the environment is deeply connected to our political, economic, cultural, and social structures. And challenges in one ultimately cannot be solved alone without also solving the others. Then at the same time, we have to remind politicians over and over again that uh, in ethical considerations, the human person is always in the center. And there are two tendencies here that are worrying in this regard, I would say. Um, firstly, it's disregarding the importance of the human being can lead to a primacy of technical solutions. And this is part of the technocratic paradigm that Pope Francis speaks about in the data theorem. And secondly, we can also see a growing tendency to view the human being itself as a problem of our planet. For instance, there are years and politicians, activists celebrating the fact that we are facing a demographic collapse or lamenting that Africa will still grow immensely in the foreseeable future. And Pope Francis also criticized this tendency specifically in, in La Data Dio. And yeah, here is our job to insist that the human being is at the center and has to be the solution. So our work then consists mainly of translating these message messages into political language and to advocate for policies that not only help us fighting the climate and environmental crisis, but to do this in a way that brings our relationship with creation back into harmony, while at the same time leaving no one behind. And this means, among others, that the social costs of the transition should not mostly be borne by those who are already struggling the most. The same goes for uh, the Global South. Um, they should not bear our costs here in Europe for transitioning. And as Stefan mentioned, this is uh, one of our main messages too. We have to remind them over and over again that we are one human family. There is a fraternity of all human beings. But we also have to point out that the current crisis that we're experiencing can ultimately be only solved together. Obviously, this puts also into question certain economic and social principles of our societies. Um, Stefan and Susie have discussed these a bit more. Um, right. Now let's turn to the challenges in the agriculture sector that we are um, facing here at Commissy on an EU level. As a side note, obviously as Commissy we support measures leading to sustainable food systems, but here in this presentation I just want to focus on the obstacles to reach this goal while ensuring the integrality of the issue. And in agriculture this means for us also ensuring the sustainability of especially small and medium farms, social peace, social coherence, and also fighting the abandonment of rural areas. Now, as you can all see in Germany, in France, in other countries, uh, we can see a growing discontent among farmers with national policies, but also EU policies. And of course, the connection is that most national measures to achieve the transition and the goals of the European Green Deal are connected to binding obligations set up by the EU. And I will just give two examples that will also show our one of our main challenges is here in um, our daily life with um, politicians. So as is widely reported, and Stefan mentioned it too, um, the main protests in Germany, for instance, but also in France, I think, concern especially the withdrawal of tax breaks on diesel. Um, but of course, that was just the last trigger to really start mass mobilization and protests. And in fact, there is a number of subsidies that are listed by the European Union that fall under the category of so-called environmentally harmful subsidies that need to be phased out. Now, these categories have been compiled by the Directorate General for the Environment of the European, European Commission. The second example I want to bring, just to mention it very shortly, is um, the Nature Restoration Law, which was developed in the same Directorate General, so the, the environment, but of course has huge impacts um, on agriculture and farmers and has been criticized by farmers and farmer organizations, not only because of the costs, but um, at least in my talks uh, with um, other organizations too, also for its apparent lack of feasibility. 
which I cannot judge, but this is what they're saying. Anyway, in these two examples, we find two of the main challenges that we encounter here. Firstly, there really is a danger, among others, that's due to technical and almost, and almost abstract division of policy areas, initiatives developed in one department of the commission, in this case, the Directorate General for the Environment, do not consider enough the connection of these initiatives to and its potential consequences for other areas, in our case, agriculture. Uh, so this is a, a well, a, a, an abstractation um, of areas that is, of course, uh, goes against um, our, um, us supporting the integrality. The second main challenge consists, constitutes the lack of listening to those who know best uh, about certain areas and will be affected the most by policies, and in this case, farmers. And when we look at the growing protests of farmers that are occurring right now, the uncertainty of the future of farming, the political backlash this already creates, and thus the uncertainty of the future of ambitious environmental policies and the European Green Deal, uh, to be honest. Um, we think here that it becomes clear that a way, a new way of doing politics must be found. So one that is able to overcome political partisanships and division, one that enables an open and transparent dialogue with all players involved. And then finally, one that enables participation in legislative processes of all those that will be affected the most bad. Of course, and here comes a bit the church perspective into this, this necessitates as a premise and openness to listen and also learn from those on the ground. And I quote here Pope Francis in a speech he gave to um, young Spanish farmers in May, 2023, I quote, the first ecologist of an era of a country, of a continent are you, those who are in the arena, those who are on the inside, the people who work with the animals, with the plants, who coexist day by day and know about their problems and their achievements, end of quote. And so in this regard, as Commissy, we have welcomed that uh, President von der Leyen has addressed in her State of the Union an increased dialogue with farmers and announced to launch a strategic dialogue on the future of agriculture in the EU. This is also one of the issues that we brought forth in a meeting with the Belgian presidency last week. And we called for a broad and true representation of the large diversity of farmers throughout the EU. Now, in fact, the first session of this strategic dialogue took place this morning. Um, but so far, it seems that only around 30 people are involved, so a very limited group. They were all selected by the Commission, of course. And as we still do not know the names or even positions of all the participants, it is impossible to say whether this composition constitutes a true representation of the large diversity of farmers throughout the EU. Another aspect that is concerning to us is the fact that to current plans, this dialogue should only last until summer. So of course, we will keep on insisting that such dialogue again, must include a broad representation and that it must not be an exception, but has to become part of a new way of doing politics. So um, yeah, my time is over and thank you. Thank you very much, Johannes. And we'll just move on to our last um, two presentations, but just a reminder, keep the questions coming in the chat. We can have a lively discussion at the end. So the next person we have is uh, Juliet from Eclairs there, and Annie will share her presentation. Okay, I thought that was going in last, but uh, perfect, I can do it now. Um, can you share the presentation, please? Thank you. Okay, um, so I will talk about uh, what... Uh, uh, the members of our network are doing regarding food systems. So first I will shortly present Eglise Verte, then what we try to do to steer uh, the work of our members regarding food systems and what they actually do. So next slide, please. Um, and then the, the next one also. Uh, so it, we are an eco label and we are a practical tool for Catholic, Protestant and Orthodox communities uh, to engage in an eco-conversion journey. 
uh, Eglisvert was launched uh, six years ago by the Council of Christian Churches in France as a follow-up of the National Ecumenical Cooperation uh, around COP21, which was held in Paris in 2015, and of course, Laudato Si the same year. Uh, Eglise Verte was first designed for churches or parishes, but we have developed special programs for associations like charities, nursing homes, spiritual centers, schools, you name it, monasteries, apostolic communities, um, youth groups, both teenagers and young adults, and uh, family courts. And in order to, to launch an uh, Eglise Verte program in your church or community, you need to form a group to coordinate the program. Then you assess your current practices through an eco-survey. You have questions regarding spiritual life, buildings, land, local and global commitments, sustainable lifestyles, etc. And each question is already a suggestion of action. So when you're done with the survey, it's very easy to draft an action plan. Um, so there are no mandatory actions uh, because differences between communities are big. And we have levels in the label, each named after a biblical plant to mark your progression. And uh, it's strongly inspired from Eco Church, managed by Arosha in the UK. Uh, and as of now, we have 850 communities in the network, so roughly 600 parishes and 250 others. So what do we do? Uh, what do we suggest uh, regarding um, sustainable food systems? So can you show the next slide, please? So we have questions in our uh, in each of our survey to you know try and, and and steer the work of our members. So for parishes, for instance, uh, do you offer uh, a way to uh, buy uh, products uh, in bulk uh, and uh, at interesting prices, or support the work of a local farmer? Uh, do you hand out uh, practical uh, advice uh, to uh, eat uh, organic or more vegetarian meals, etc. Um, next, please. Uh, so for associations, we have an entire section uh, on food because uh, uh, a lot of the time they have, uh, you know, a self and they uh, serve a lot of meals uh, each day. So uh, do you source your products locally? Do you source uh, how many percent of your vegetable, meat, or uh, dairy products do you source organically? Uh, do you have information handed out regarding sustainability to your guests? Uh, do you have a plan to fight food waste? Such questions. Next. Um, for monasteries, uh, if you produce things on your land, do they have an environmental certification such as uh, organic agriculture or other certification? Do you try to reduce your nitrate pollution? Which kind of fertilizer do you use, compost, chemical, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So we see we have a, a wide range of uh, questions to help communities uh, engage in actions regarding food systems. Um, so next, please. I'm not sure I still have questions. Oh, no. So, yeah. Um, and uh, after we've asked all these questions, uh, of course, we do not uh, let them alone and try and figure out some actions. We have fact sheets regarding purchases, events, global solidarity, composting, land management. We've had an online training on land management, and we've discussed, for instance, you know, what kind of lease can you put in place to help new farmers with more ecological uh, farming techniques uh, uh, settle on your land, etc. And we try and, um, and uh, uh, spread information through articles on our website on really diverse subjects such as for instance, um, the orthodox way of fasting, because in the orthodox traditions on Wednesdays, Fridays, and four times a year during Lent, you are fasting on a vegan diet um, uh, about, you know, su successful projects such as a permacultural project in a parish in the southwest of France. So we try to share information on such subjects. And so uh, what... Uh, what happens in uh, in the reality on the ground? So I would say quite uh, it's quite exceptional the diversity of uh, of things that happen everywhere in France. I will take a first example. Uh, it's a spiritual center uh, near Lyon, and it's a Jesuit. 
and uh, they've uh, had the three major changes in their um, transformation towards uh, becoming an eco-spiritual center. First, they installed a young farmer over one hectare to produce organi organic vegetables. They figured out a way to collect rainwater for the irrigation needs and people who are doing retreats, they will be able to help and get their hands dirty. Uh, so, of course, they will offer also retreats on um, on uh, topics related to ecology. So you see a, a retreat on... A, a, uh, on food and they changed their service provider for the kitchen so they went from an international company which is huge it's the 10th employer worldwide to uh, two cooks who can uh, source local and seasonal products prepare more vegetarian meals involve guests in the preparation of meals etc and they also negotiated smoothly the end uh, of a two hectares Christmas tree plantation on their land. Uh, it was uh, spraying pesticides several times a year, and uh, they will use this space in the future uh, to f as a grazing area. They've uh, taken in a small herd of sheep from a, a monastery, and the sisters were too old to take care of them. So. You see, if you have a land and you have guests, you can do a wide range of actions. Uh, we also have many monasteries who are doing exceptional things. We can go to the next slide. So monasteries are the biggest landowners in the Christian world in France because, you know, the Catholic Church has been expropriated during the French Revolution. They welcome and feed guests all year round. So they are big players for us, both on the production and the consumption sites. So many of them, they have leases with conventional farmers. So this is an opportunity to, to change in that in the next few years. And of course, they have a, an intense spiritual life. So you can see, um, uh, you know, the blessing of, uh, of fields uh, from these sisters. And these sisters, they also welcome woofers. So, you know, young people are not that young. Uh, who uh, get uh, food and shelter in exchange for agricultural work. Um, we have other many great examples from monasteries, um, but I will move on to parishes now. Uh, for We've seen uh, something uh, uh, getting back in fashion. It's the, it's the Thanksgiving service or office. Uh, so it's a Lutheran tradition. It has been a bit forgotten because we're not a rural and agricultural society anymore. But it's uh, it's coming back during season of creation, for instance, and then you know people bring in uh, fruit and vegetables, and then they are being redistributed to local charity, to students, or uh, they are cooked uh, by everyone after that. For parishes with a garden, next slide, please. We see very interesting things. Uh, for instance, uh, you know you can. Uh, people put it, planting uh, plants uh, with a quote from the Bible um, or um, uh, some, uh, you know, doing partnerships with local associations to tend uh, to the vegetable garden and it increase uh, connections with uh, local actors and mostly non-religious. Uh, next, please. Um, so here you see the involvement of a youth group uh, to care for the tree nursery in the parish garden where there was nothing before, just grass. Next, please. Uh, what we can see also is, uh, you know, plant exchanges, uh, sowing uh, tomatoes or uh, uh, herbs uh, in the in the spring, uh, and it's uh, it's very. Uh, uh, it brings life and uh, con and relations in the parish. Next, please. We so we have many uh, joyful examples. Uh, you can have hens in your parish. Uh, you if you own land, um, use it for a shared garden. And next, please. Uh, also. Um, sensitizing uh, parish members to actions regarding uh, your diet. Next, I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, and uh, I would also like to mention, you know, the spiritual link. Uh, it's not, uh, you You can link what you eat with uh, spirituality. And this is the example of uh, Hildegard von Bingen uh, dinner. And next, please, I'm almost done. So what we see in our network is that our members 
engage in a diversity of actions, whether it's on the production or the consumption side. Uh, there's always a spiritual aspect. Of course, some topics are harder to approach. Animal farming, uh, the, if uh, the ecological solution is uh, more expensive than the conventional food, a conventional agriculture, if you're in a you know, wine producing region or cereal producing regions. And in France, uh, we have an opportunity to connect more with uh, non-religious actors because churches are a bit working uh, you know, alone in their corner because of uh, hard secularism. But uh, through uh, food, we could uh, have uh, more connections with other actors. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliet. And for our last presentation, we hand over to Ferenc. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm working in northeastern Hungary in a village of 3,000, 4,000 people. And just to have a, a glimpse of the village where I work, uh, which is uh, populated about two thirds with the Roma gypsy minority who are also living in uh, poverty. Um, which is a prime example of what Pope Francis calls uh, the throwaway culture. Uh, these regions of Hungary uh, have been uh, artificially developed during the socialist era, uh, producing mainly steel for the Soviet uh, Union, uh, an immense industrial growth, an immense demographic growth that has uh, already started collapsing in the 80s. So um, we really see that those who had better education, those who had uh, savings uh, moved away from the villages to where workplaces where better opportunities were. So uh, these people uh, are really left behind. And this, this is the third generation of, of those left behind at that time and their inheritance is uh, this uh, helplessness, this hopelessness um, and dependency. And from that, you can suspect that uh, there was a, a tradition of, of agriculture before the heavy industry came, but it has been already lost by the time of the collapse of, of this industry. So these families have, have no really um, agricultural experience and to to start start restart agriculture in this village um, you could get uh, very good equipment tractors machines what whatever and and with uh, I don't know five people you could work on so many acres of land but this doesn't solve the problem of the village because with with the modern uh, equipment you don't need so much manual labor so, but then if you hand out uh, seeds to everyone in the village uh, to make them grow something in their own backyard, uh, that's not even enough to, to make a real difference in the family budget of, of living and, and uh, nourishing the, the family table. So somewhere in between with traditional and modern technologies, you have to support that. And what is also um, a direction that we would like to follow. We just started this work four years ago. So we are really into make, establishing bonds and fostering local communities to start building a plan together. And uh, a very important inspiration is uh, Tibor Horta from a university in Cluj, whose main topic is cultural landscapes, which means that, for example, to protect biodiversity, you also have to protect some traditional agricultural activities because um, mm, these non-aggressive methods have, have led to the development of special ecosystems. And this leads us to a need for a complex village portfolio because uh, people don't usually pay that much in a supermarket for foods uh, produced with traditional methods and people don't really look for jobs. Oh, I want to go and live in a village and and home with my two hands or something like that. Uh, so you need additional support. And 
this can be also monetary, but this is also a societal prestige, uh, which can also lead then to tourism, for example, um, offering gu guided tours in a farming environment or a nat natural foresting environment. So, um, but this is also not yet enough. Uh, we really hope to see some IT companies setting up offices in the villages and then those uh, programmers who, who can work internationally through the internet can really pay for services in the village. So we really have to rethink the role of the village in a European um, society as it is. And the key to this is a quality education, um, which is also um, something that we hardly have uh, allocated enough resources to. And uh, I know that the migration policies of my country are very controversial. And still we see uh, a lot of workers visas uh, being given to Southeastern Asian people because they don't have to be educated that much to do uh, factory work and so on. So, um, yes, uh, this leave, leaves our people, the, the Roma, the Gypsy people, to be always helpless and, and dependent on aid programs. And our own work is uh, also dependent on politics. So we, we really try to establish something also financially sustainable to help uh, rural development. This is our aim and um, we hope to be able to uh, invite many partners and visitors to the village to see how we are doing. And I, I want to uh, come to close my, my small time, which is also the end of, of the series of the keynote speakers in the Ignatian spirit um, to make a small break as Stefan has called us to as religious and just have um, 30 seconds of silence and an examine to look back what has touched you what you have heard where do you feel God moving And as our motto comes from the prayer of the Lord Jesus, uh, I invite you to pray in your own language, the Our Father, uh, for this alliance, for the future of uh, this initiative. Mi atyánk, aki a mennyekben vagy, szenteltessék meg a te nevad, jöjjön el a te országod, legyen meg a te akaratod, amint a mennyben, úgy a földön is. Minden napi kenyerünket add meg nekünk ma, és bocsáss meg védkeinket, miképpen mi is megbocsájtunk az ellenünk védkezőknek, és ne vigy minket kísértésbe, de szabadíts meg gonosztól, mert tiéd az ország, a hatalom és a dicsőség mindörökké állunk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ferenc, and also thank you for that thoughtful moment of silence at the end. So, we have come to the end of our speakers, and Thank you very much for listening. We've also technically come to the end of our time, but we'll ex especially extend for another 10 minutes or so, so we can have some questions. Um, so I will start with the questions going from the first speaker. So to, um, to Bella, who was asked, was organizational email newsletters considered as a communication channel? Thanks for the question. I have to say, yeah, considered, yes. Colin, can you mute yourself? So yes, we considered uh, the newsletters too, but uh, we couldn't really go further than considering them because it's very hard to know how many people are subscribed to them. So yes, I was, I was thinking about how to get that information, but we couldn't. Also here at Jesk, we have three newsletters and we have 
as many subscribers as I don't know Facebook or Instagram followers so they are significant for us and I guess significant for others too but we have no way knowing that maybe in the future we will if we, if we make a deeper audit of communication channels thanks brother and Stefan how do the German bishops use your work um I must admit, probably not enough. Um, I think it helps a lot to support lay people and priests who, who really want to support the environment, and they can use the study and um, and and um, use it as a starting point. And um, uh, it, it has some influence on the German government and has some influence on, on, on local politicians. But I'm skeptical whether the majority of the bishops really dived deep, deep into it. Um, they are probably very busy with other things, unfortunately. Thank you. And another question to Stefan is, I'm happy to see that 25% of the organizations are involved in research. What type of research are they doing? Um, are, they collaborative, are they collaborating with research organizations such as universities? And does any research focus on the global south? Oh, that's to oh, that's to Bella, not to. Thanks very much. Um, I don't know by heart all of them because it's quite a number. Can you mute yourself again, please? Sorry, we are actually sitting very close to each other. So these research institutions include all kinds of uh, organizations. There are universities among them, obviously, Jesuit universities too. There are small research centers. And some of this research is uh, more focused on local issues. So it's really diverse. Obviously, the more institutionalized ones are just a normal part of the academic community. So of course, they publish, they go to conferences, they, they do what researchers do. And the smaller ones, more think tanks, they talk to their relevant audience. I do think some of them work on the Global South, but I cannot give a good example from the top of my head. So sorry for that. Okay. Next is a question for Susie. So in a country like the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, where environmental issues such as protecting forests are important, how do you interact with, this, with the decision makers um, for the conditions of the farmers? Did you work with environmental organizations to make sure that agriculture is uh, taken as a seriously as a priority in their countries? Um, yeah, well, um, the, the, the particular um, uh, issue that I was referring to is actually um, we've been working with local farmers organizations um, and um, they have they were threatened uh, or their uh, their land was threatened to be um, grabbed by um, the government to build uh, a large scale agroindustrial park. Um, and they used um, what they call a forest concession um, to protect their entire um, communal area. Um, and in a forest concession, there is different things that you're allowed to do. On the one hand, you have to reforest, you have to maintain the forest, but you can also uh, use part of it um, for sustainable agricultural practices. And that is where we help them um, to um, um, improve their agroecological um, practices. Um, and this allows them to, one, um, use the forest resources that there are, um, secondly, protect um, the forest, and thirdly, still uh, make a living out of um, agriculture on part of the of the forest land. And but um, because of this uh, this this forest forest concession that they have, they can actually uh, protect protect themselves um, against um, uh, land grabbing. So I don't know. We we did that um, together with the um, um, farmers. Um, um, unions and farmers federations uh, in the in the particular area but uh, that doesn't in, in the area that we are working in it's not really a very densely um, uh, forested area it's more like a, a savanna type area so probably there's different um, uh, possibilities there 
Thank you. And the next question is for Johannes. Apart from farmers, does Commerce also engage with scientists about the feasibility of various policy scenarios? Um, farmers might not always be the best source of information on the topic of transition. Thank you. No, of course, uh, in these 10 minutes, I had to focus on one specific aspect of our work, and that was farmers, because we are currently seeing farmer protests all, over, all around. No, Commerce, for instance, is also part of the um, LC, the European Lata to Sea um, Alliance, which is an organization of, well, Brussels based um, Catholic organizations, um, NGOs, and us um, who work on, on the environment with activists and actors from many different fields. Um, so, no, not just farmers, of course. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, Juliet. Do these projects that are um, started in the parishes or other communities inspire people to take their action further? For example, do you think they advocate for policies that reflect and value? Um, we are not really there yet, you know, on the advocacy level. Uh, I think it's um, because of, you know, French really hardcore secularism, uh, churches, um, whether on the national or the local level, they raise their voices only on very specific subjects and not, uh, you know, general policy subjects. So I hope it will come. Uh, what we've seen are some local oppositions to maybe, you know, like building a highway or things like that. But regarding uh, the agricultural debate, uh, it hasn't gone that far. But um what we see with uh, garden projects it, uh, is that it's way more than just growing food and that you develop new connections with um, with uh, other organization, with the maybe the, the city council and stuff like that. So it could go further. Thank you. And then a, a final question for Ferenc. A very impressive project, Ferenc, exclamation mark. Are the village inhabitants also owners of the surrounding lands? Can they decide about the land use? Could they farm it themselves, sell it or lease it? Uh, usually it's not the case. So it is also an example of the problem of the subsidies that has been mentioned that wealthy investors bought the lands and they are very hard to trace and they contribute almost nothing to the village. Uh, yeah, so that's a really uh, big obstacle at hand. So thank you all. We're, we're just about to wrap up and uh, just some practical things. Thank you for coming and we're, I'll be in, a, in touch with uh, probably some feedback and the report and all this. Um, but thank you for your time and just for some closing remarks, I'll pass on to Bella. Thanks very much also from my side for all of you who came and listened to all these interesting presentations. And for closing, I just wanted to repeat one more this invitation for all of you and for all of your networks. We are building further this work on agriculture and the role of the Christian churches uh, in the advocacy. So if you see anyone, including yourself, uh, interested in this work, please send us an email or reach out in any way to JESC and we are really happy to include you in the process. It will be a slow participatory way of building something that fits everyone who is in it. So don't be afraid if you are too big, too small, too slow, too fast. Uh, we will work together the way that fits everyone and we want to make our voices heard. So the green transition in a solid in a solider manner happens finally in Europe. So thanks for all for coming. Uh, thank you. So as we said, this is the end of a process, the six months of recognizing these beautiful organizations, of which five we've heard of today. And it's the start of trying to do something about these really important issues we've um we've heard about today. I don't know whether it's possible to do a sort of a online uh, round of applause for the for the speakers um and we'll uh, like i said we'll be in touch and thank you very much everyone for your time and uh, all the best now take care
Thanks for having us. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Merci. Au revoir.